For 16 weekends a year, for the last 13 years, from Australia to Brazil to Mexico, South Africa, America, and the whole of Europe, that was how closely James and I used to work together. And because of that, we got to know each other pretty well. And I very rapidly discovered that James was a very special sort of person. He didn't think the way other people do. He certainly didn't act the way other people do. And he was always a very exciting, stimulating, and fun, unpredictable, but very authoritative person to be with. In fact, it was very obvious to anybody from his very earliest days that whatever James chose to do in later life, he was going to make a success of it. James Hunt, holding the flag up for Britain, driving a superb race in far off Japan, and James Hunt is going to win the World Championship. Very much the public schoolboy, James was educated in the magnificent surroundings of Wellington College, where he excelled at ball games. But watching a club race at Silverstone whetted his appetite for motor racing. With his good looks and charm, and the fact that it was all fun to him, James was no drab conformist, always the centre of attraction. But under his devil-may-care manner, he was deadly serious about getting to the top. The glamour and trappings of success were to come later, though. It was in Formula 3 that his career started to take off. And James Hunt is through. Hunt is up into second place now, ahead of Trimmer. Trimmer, who was second, has been pushed down to third position by James Hunt, number 21, from Sutton, 23 years old. He's been driving for three years, and here he is in the Red Lotus. At circuits like Crystal Palace, James's forceful driving attracted the attention of no less a man than Lord Alexander Hesketh, who recruited James to his unique Formula One team. Hesketh Racing is a team that is made up of rule breakers, and the fact that we've managed to break some of the rules and get away with it, not the rules written in a book, but the unwritten rules, that you can never come into Formula One unless you have a completely professional team, that you can never come into Formula One with a driver who has a reputation only for crashing cars, that you can never come into Formula One with a team manager who's an ex-used car dealer, that you can never come into Formula One with a rich young man who knows nothing about it, that you can never come into Formula One with a whole lot of mechanics that no other racing team would hire. I think we've, we've proved something by that. I think that the enthusiasm we have in the team makes up for an awful lot that we lack in professionalism. How did they start? How did they begin? Hesketh Racing are going to win. We're all human beings, and if one remembers that fact, we all start with the same physical advantages and or handicaps, and therefore there's no, there's no reason on paper why they should be better, apart from their advantage and experience. Oh, driver we keep in clothing and meals, as long as he goes on turning his wheels. His name is James Hunt, known as the Shunt. What he likes best is a nice glass of milk. The much derided Hesketh team made their mark in 1973. The next year they had their own car and James was a spectacular winner at Silverstone's non-championship international trophy. And Hunt going through! James Hunt takes the lead and Woodcoat in an absolutely superb manoeuvre. My goodness, that was a consummate bit of motor racing artistry the like of which I have seldom seen before. Indeed it was. Hesketh and Hunt, the fun team with the teddy bear mascot, had elatedly arrived. Congratulations. You had to do it the hard way. I didn't. The gear shift came off. Okay. Sorry about that. The clutch went on behind and then the gear lever came off on that too. Really tremendous. They say the first win is always the hardest, but now it really was the big time. 1975, a genuine shot at the World Championship. Second in the Argentine and sixth in Brazil. But round seven in Holland was sensational. In the gleaming white Hesketh Ford, James drove a race of sheer brilliance to win his first Formula One victory against the might of the twin Ferraris of Nicky Lauda and Clay Regazzoni. The amateurs had beaten the professionals. Sheer enthusiasm had defeated massive budgets. 
18 years later, Lord Hesketh, now government chief whip in the House of Lords, remembers it all vividly. One of the things about James was that he had huge support from the British racing public. And we always went to a lot of trouble with our supporters. We, we used to make great effort with them. And I remember riding around on the, on the truck after that we'd won. And Zandvoort's a pretty gloomy place. It's just a lot of sand dunes. And on top of every sand dune were these just waves, waves, and waves of Union Jacks. And it was a wonderful feeling to feel that those people who traveled all the way around Europe and had seen frustration after frustration finally saw the result that they wanted. And uh, even today, which is 18 years later, it still gives me goose pimples. Now, adored by the nation and partnered by beautiful women, fun-loving James Hunt was a superstar. Nicky Lauda was world champion for Ferrari in 1975 and aimed to make it two in a row the next year. But now he was up against James Hunt driving for McLaren after a depleted wallet had forced Alexander Hesketh out of Formula One. James and Nicky were rivals but always liked and respected each other. I remember very well in 1976 I had my accident, I couldn't race for three races. But James was pressing on all through the year. And I must say today that the McLaren he was driving was not as competitive as my Ferrari. And in the end, he did beat me by one point at the Japanese Grand Prix for the championship. So from my point of view, James was an incredible personality because you could see him with the people on the street talking, low-key maybe, and you could even put him on the table with the Queen of England. He would always know how to behave. For me, he was the most charismatic personalities ever been in Formula One. With four wins for Lauda's Scarlet Ferrari in the first eight races, 1976 looked a lost cause for James and McLaren, although the Spanish race had seen a second superb Grand Prix win for the Englishman at Harama, in spite of initially being disqualified for a technical infringement. James stood on the top step of the rostrum in front of King Juan Carlos, one step above Lauda. Six races later, at the Nürburgring in Germany, Lauda nearly died as a hideous fire engulfed his Ferrari. Amazingly, a badly scarred Nicky was back three races later in Italy for an almost unbelievably heroic fourth place and three vital points. James won the next race in Canada and the following round 15 at Watkins Glen in America. Lauda was third and now the chips were really down for the vital last race in Japan with a confident Nicky leading the championship by a mere three points and trying to outsight James. At quarter to eight in the morning when I was still asleep there was a great banging on the interconnecting door of my room so I went and opened it and there was Nicky already in his overalls marching into my room as a Morning, I'm going to be the world champion today. <laughs> In the early morning hours, Britain excitedly turned on the TV for pictures from Japan. Despite appalling weather, they looked great as James took control. And it's James Hunt, who takes the lead in the Japanese Grand Prix, with fellow Rich John Watson trying to overtake him, as they swoop round the right-handers. Hunt leads from the thing, and fifth, at all six, is Nicky Lauder. To win the championship, James had to finish at least three points ahead of Lauda, and on lap three, it looked as though he had them. Nicky's Ferrari was in the pits, and the Austrian was getting out of it. It's madness to race in these conditions, he said, and walked away with James still in.